Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is episode 132 with Anders Lilovic. Anders is the founder and CEO of Focal Point, which helps modern enterprises manage their procurement processes. They recently raised a $5.5 million seed round in August 2022. We're going to be talking about procurement because I don't honestly understand anything about it, and so this is a really interesting thing. I always love to learn about new things, so... Uh, I assume this episode will be a little bit more on the informational, educational uh, uh, realm and possibly some of his journey. So uh, thank you, Anders. Why don't you introduce Focal Point a little bit more and how you got the idea to get involved in it, and we'll go from there. Focal Point was founded in March of 2020, so right before the pandemic started. Uh, I have been working in procurement as a practitioner for 25 years before starting the company, and the challenge that we're looking to solve is the fact that the existing infrastructure providers are dealing really well with the tactical aspects of procurement, meaning the transactional part. So storing a contract, uh, sending out a purchase order, receiving an invoice, paying suppliers and so on. And most of the work, if not all of the important work, it's done before stuff turns into a contract. So gathering your requirements, deciding which suppliers to invite, deciding which internal stakers to stakeholders to involve in a process, that all gets done manually, probably in a spreadsheet and email and pretty poorly. And having managed large global procurement organizations, I know firsthand how difficult it is to manage a couple hundred people uh, using an Excel spreadsheet. And sort of the, the the starting point of my journey was Excel is not a management tool. And that was kind of the slogan that I used. Like it, it was never meant to manage a complex process. And that, that's really what we're trying to solve. All right. So what is procurement? Procurement in a nutshell is, is buying stuff, right? So any organization that you have, any company that you have are critically reliant on third parties, right? So for example, we're a software company. We could not exist without a cloud provider. So we have to select a cloud provider to be able to host our software. Uh, and then we have other providers that underlies that. So the folks that do penetration testing, the people that manage our uh, you know, software distribution, uh, people that do our HR systems and so on. And if you think of a company like a hotel, for example, they're critically dependent on soap being inside the hotel rooms as uh, as, as new guests come, right? So that soap has to be acquired by somebody, it has to be distributed to the hotels, then it has to be delivered by a third party cleaning service probably uh, before it shows up in, in that um, hotel room. And all these things are done by procurement and supply chain where they look at the need of the organization long term, they find the best suppliers at the best price, and then you know enter into long term contracts. And procurement has evolved significantly. So when I started in procurement in 25, 25 years ago, it was all about saving money on long-term contracts. But now it has evolved significantly to where we think about things like supply chain disruptions. We think about supplier risk. We think about diversity and inclusion. We think about environmental and sustainability goals that organizations have. And all of these things are, are things that procurement manages. So not only do you have to pick the best provider with the, with the best cost, but also the one that's going to take care of your data the best, the one that's going to manage your processes the best, the folks that are uh, going to be um, managing your environmental and sustainability goals, and it becomes much more complicated. So obviously, organizations want to get things done as quickly as possible, but at the same time, they layer on all these levels of complexity. And that's really what procurement is today, and it continues to evolve. And I think we all kind of understand the whole idea of uh, now the safety equipment that people needed for uh, COVID. And who would have thought that you can actually shut down an assembly line because you can't get uh, masks and hand sanitizer. So if you think about all these things that have to come into to play, for example, to assemble a car, you need to make sure the steel shows up on time, the paint shows up on time, the glass shows up on time, the plastics and all the parts and pieces all at the same time. Who would have thought that you actually need, you know, PPE equipment to actually run an assembly line and that can literally shut you down. So that's a lot about procurement and sort of like a 
pack it in way. But as you can imagine, right, managing all these things in Excel and, and, and disparate processes becomes a challenge. So beyond Excel, what are some other basic mistakes that companies make when setting up procurement processes? I think procurement people try to solve for world hunger and world peace all at the same time. And they tend to over-engineer the process so that make it overly complex and, and kind of grind things to a halt. And I think that's why sometimes procurement is, is not the most popular organization within uh, companies. Um, so I think over-engineering the process and making it like, the most intellectually uh, challenging process to sort of manage becomes a problem, but also not involving the right stakeholders up front. So a lot of times, these large global contracts that involves multiple stakeholders in multiple countries, for example, can come to a grinding halt if you haven't involved the right stakeholders. Say, like, wait a minute, this person in this division needs to opine on this particular requirement, and then you have to start over again. So it, it's a, it's a, it, it, buying stuff sounds easy, but as you're making decisions for the entire enterprise, you have to make sure that everybody's bought in, they're all singing from the same hymn notes, and they're working in unison to make good results. How can you identify who are the right stakeholders and how can you communicate with them and, and manage all of this? That's part of what we're solving here at Focal Point. So making sure you have a structured process that is repeatable, but adaptable to the, what you're buying. So you, we talked a little bit about risk, we talked about criticality, we talked about ESG, we talked about diversity and inclusion. So you need to make sure that all of those factors are flexible in your process to make sure that if you're buying something that is a commodity that is uh, non-critical to the organization, then you take you know, this path and you involve these stakeholders and you get these sign-offs along the way. That way in a structured process, there are no, uh, what I would call surprises along the way. And as you then sort of think about the more complex buys, like let's say you're outsourcing human resources processing or onboarding, whatever the case may be, right? Highly sensitive, highly critical to the funk, to the organization. And if data goes uh, waywards, it's a lot of risk, right? Then you can say, all right, you, make, you need to make sure all of these things are done and buttoned up properly and, and, and that you, that process is followed. And the mistake people sometimes do is take that commodity, low criticality scenario and apply the the, the more complex uh, type of uh, acquisition method to it. And that makes it challenging, right? Because, you know, procurement people are risk averse just because of how we grew up sort of thing, right? So we try to sort of overcorrect and make it uh, overly difficult to, to do business with us. And, you know, you need to have a process that is flexible both up and down, depending on the situation you're in. And having that structured process, having a, a communication process that is off email and trackable globally. So you can actually say, yes, I did involve these people. Um, here are the signups, here's the evidence behind it. That helps you be more nimble. It also helps you when audit comes around to say, all right, something went wrong. How, how did it go wrong? And, and, and did you follow your actual your own process? So in the case that something goes wrong, what do those audits look like? Depends what goes wrong, right? So I, I worked for a bank once upon a time and we, you know, before I, before I joined the organization, the, um, the, the bank had decided that they were going to have ATMs, you know, cash machines, uh, you know, they get serviced by equipment manufacturers, but they also need to get cash delivered. And this bank had the idea of we're going to have our uh, equipment manufacturer, our equipment providers also manage our cash delivery. And at some point in time, four years into the agreement, uh, basically, it turns out that there was a Ponzi scheme going on and we were out 20 point, some, some $20 million, right? The music stopped, the Ponzi scheme couldn't, it couldn't, couldn't keep up anymore. And basically we were out $20 million. Uh, at that point in time, you can imagine audit and internal affairs ascended onto the procurement organization. Like what went wrong here guys? And really it involves procurement about how the organization got into this uh, quagmire to begin with, uh, what internal processes were done on the cash management side to make sure that, you know, you have to clear, you have to basically balance your books every, every day. Clearly, that that wasn't being done properly, right? Because how do you how do you how do you short twenty million bucks? Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of processes that need to be sort of sorted out, not just on the procurement side, but also on the day to day side and how things are managed. Um, and I can go on and on and on about about these types of things, right? Because because everybody thinks that they can buy stuff, 
And clearly this is an example of that. It's like, oh, it makes sense. This equipment manufacturer goes to the goes to the ATM, they can handle cash as well, right? It makes sense intuitively, right? But there's a reason why there's armored cars and why they have like plate, you know, uh, bulletproof glass on it, because it's so worth a lot of money, right? And um, so sometimes a good idea is not really a good idea once you think it through. Um, so the audits can sometimes be fairly thorough depending on the risk, right? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And then there are other things that go wrong. So for example, we have a, again, same bank, we had um, statements being printed uh, and uh, you, you print on one side and then you pass it through for another side, you print on one side and then you turn it over and print the other, the other side. Uh, they had a problem where uh, something came out of order. So on the one on the front side of the statement was uh, one person's information on the back side was another person's information. When those things go out, they, you know, sort of say, well, what were the internal processes of the printer uh, to, that just should have caught this, right? And clearly the operator screwed up. When the, when the thing jammed, they should have started the batch over, but they didn't because they were in a hurry. So like all these kinds of things become discoverable in an audit and you have to make sure you get your things right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it may not sound like it's a procurement's problem, but it kind of is, right? Yeah, it's always your problem to to deal with. I'll, I'll give an example because it, it sounds like some of the things I'm used to doing in the past, I was involved in international trade. And so I would have customers come to me and say, and I'm, I, you'll laugh here, but I'm serious. I want 100 containers of chicken feet, frozen chicken feet from Brazil. And so I would have to go and do due diligence on the manufacturers or the importers or the you know companies, whoever it was, so that I could make sure that I was coming to them with an absolute certainty that like these guys are legit, right? I, I'm working on this right now. Um, I had a client running a high risk um, business and he wanted an additional payment processor to make sure that, you know, in case he had issues with the other ones, it wouldn't take down his business. And so I went and I started to look for people and I came across someone and I asked them a million questions. And then I knew, you know, if I was going to sign on as an affiliate for that other business and then bring this client to them, that this client was not going to have any problems because that's my reputation. If this, if this company either steals their money, doesn't provide the service or, you know, whatever happens, it's me. That's my name. It's, you know, that he's not, he can't do anything to that business, but he can make sure that I don't get a new business. So with that said, um, how should someone go about doing due diligence on these third party providers to make sure they are legit? What are some specifics that they should think about and, and questions they should be asking or, or documents, things that they should be looking for and, and requesting and, and not, you know, demanding before making any decisions? Kind of depends on what you're acquiring and, and who's acquiring it, right? So there are a lot of processes that organizations have built now to make sure the company is stable, legit, and has an appropriate business process. So for example, make sure their financial stability is sound. How do you do that? Well, if they're publicly traded, you can just put, pull that data down and find out yourself, right? Number two, if they're private, get audited financials to make sure that they're liquid, make sure they have the capital positions that you want them to do. And when we were when, when I worked for banking, they kind of said, "Look, if the if the company is critical, pretend the pretend as though you're lending them a bunch of money, right?" And that kind of puts a whole different lens on it. To say, "Well, would we underwrite this company to lend them money?" And that 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 kind of how we treated it. And then you can sort of get into what are their customer base? Do they have customers that look like us? Do they have customers that are you know dominating their business? Meaning, you know, the worst thing and the best thing for some companies is to get Walmart as a customer because the volumes are so big, right? So they can really make you or break you. And other customers kind of say, well, am I really going to compete with Walmart to get your attention, right? So again, like that's something you need to think about. Um, if they are dealing with di data, make sure that they have a secure environment, that they're encrypting their data, both in REST and at transit. Uh, make sure they have a control environment so you can request things like a SOC 2 or an ISA certification. Uh, but, you know, really make sure that they have the qualifications and the certifications that is relevant to the industry that they're doing. And again, being a startup selling to large enterprises, we have to 
get our SOC too. We have to get our ISO certification. We have to do, go through a variety of, uh, you know, information security assessment. And all these things are relevant to uh, making sure that your companies that you're, that you're doing business with really uh, have the best uh, intentions and the environments that you would have at the end of the day. The worst thing you can think about is I've outsourced this now, so this is no longer my problem. And I've seen that so many times is companies outsource things and then they don't have the proper governance in place to manage that relationship. Um, and, you know, just because it's outsourced doesn't mean you don't have to manage it. Right. So I think as, a, as an industry and as a discipline, we're getting better and better at sort of saying, OK, now that we've outsourced this thing, what are the KPIs and KROs? And, and the metrics that we need to monitor on a regular basis to make sure that, you know, the level of service is being kept up. You said the term SOC 2 and ISO certifications. Please explain what those are. A SOC 2 is, a, is an overview of your control environment. So anything from how you onboard and manage your employees, how you secure your data centers, how, you are, how, how you're pushing code into production, how you're testing code how you're monitoring uh, vulnerabilities, how you're dealing with day zero vulnerabilities. It's basically a very long checklist of, of requirements that you need to maintain. And then you hire an auditing firm to come in and say, you know, focal point says they have these, uh, um, these controls in place. We have validated these 200 controls and we have seen evidence that they have done this for the past six months or a year. And then, here are some findings where they can make improvements and so on and so forth. So that's basically uh, SOC 2. So they come back and they, 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 they monitor you for a period of time to make sure that the controls that you have stated are actually in place. An ISO certification is, is more like a point in time sort of thing. So here are the standards to which, um, uh, to which we, ha we are setting up. For SOC 2 and ISO are very similar. Um, but the, so the ISO basically, you get an auditing firm to come in and say, yeah, they've done it. Then they do a control assessment on top of that. And so the SOC 2 is sort of like an ongoing audit. The ISO is more of a point in time. You've got to make sure you maintain it. And ISO is more common in, in Europe and Asia. SOC 2 is more common in the United States. What does it cost to get these certifications? There's a lot of startups have come up now uh, to, to mitigate some of those costs. So basically, a long time ago, you had to pay a consulting firm to say, come in and help us get SOC 2 compliant. And that would normally be like a multiple, maybe even a couple of year engagement to say, all right, here are all the controls you need, and here's how you document them, and here's how you put them in place, yada, yada. So now you have um, companies, and I can put a plug in here for a company called Drada, that basically says, here are all the controls you need to put in place. We're going to integrate your AWS or your Google environment and your, you know, all, all your control points that you have that are systematic into Drata and document what you have and what you don't have, help you put the policies in place, help you get uh, background checks in place for your employees and kind of provide that as a turnkey service. And then on top of that, you have to pay an auditor to come in and validate those things. So for us, it took us about a year. Uh, the service for Drata is, it's in, the low 10,000s and the audit basically depends on who you pick, right? So you could pick a tier one consulting firm and you're going to pay tier one prices, or you could pick a uh, less well-known uh, consulting firm and you will pay those kind of prices. But, you know, a company should expect to pay $25,000 to get a SOC 2 type 2. Um, that's, you know, again, like for a startup, that's quite a bit of money for Large companies, not so much, right? But it's the table stakes in this case. I was just looking up the website uh, as you were talking about them, and it seems like they just raised $200 million. It's a big business, right? Because everybody who wants to do business with enterprises need those certifications, right? So Drada can do a GDPR certification for Europe. They can do ISO 27001 uh, for your control environments. They can do Type 2 SOC 2s. So like they can do uh, whatever sort of standards that are put in place by companies they can they can do and again like i i'm not pointing out drawdown in particular like there's there's quite a few out there that do it um but it's, it's big business and this is the type of stuff procurement looks for to say right do you have one of these these audits can we see it what are your outstanding items and like and, and who did it like so all these things are, are are part of the things that companies do 
to make sure their, their suppliers are legit. Drada looks like an interesting business. It seems like auditors, I, th I think being an auditor, it seems like a really good profitable business. Well, it's interesting now, right? Because audit has changed so much. So back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, let's say you were auditing procurement, you would pull out, you know, procurement does, let's say a million transactions a year, you would pull out a hundred, maybe 200 transactions and make sure those were done according to plan by paper documentation. Today, everything is online. So you can say, all right, here's the 2 million transactions, audit away, right? And you can then put a lot of these things in systematic ways like Tableau or Power BI, and you can look for the outliers and say, all right, here are the things I need to audit, not just pick a random number. And all these things are becoming a lot easier and more automated, right? And I'm not trying to, uh, you know, denigrate the audit function. I think now they can provide a lot more value by the virtue of having these systems in place. And again, this is why Excel is kind of a pain in the tuchus because it's, it doesn't actually keep the records. It doesn't actually maintain the records as, as well as a systematic process and say, all right, show me how something came into procurement. Show me who touched it along the way and when and how, and show me what happened at the end of it, right? And this is why, you know, some of these systems exist, right? What part in a company's life cycle would procurement be, become something that's like important to think about? Typically what I've seen are procurement organizations can be relevant in some way, shape, form or fashion as you start managing expenses for suppliers in the 50 to $100 million range, right? It becomes kind of substantial. It also depends on the business that you're in. So for example, if you're in financial services, you know, these things are mandatory, you, you know, at a certain point in time. So if you're dealing with customer data, if you're dealing with uh, financial transactions, like managing your third parties become that much more important. Um, I would be surprised, although it happens from time to time, to see companies with, you know, that are billion dollar companies and they have no procurement organization, right? So it's the wild, wild west, you know, everybody goes out and picks their own. Uh, and then at some point in time, they have to come to a reckoning of, of trying to get cost out or they have a fraud or they have some sort of incident. And like Twitter. Correct. Exactly right. When you're developing code, right, you'll have like a staging environment and you'll have a production environment. It seems like Twitter didn't have a staging environment. So all of the code they were pushing out was automatically live. So... Procurement code, I mean, it doesn't matter the size of the company, you're gonna have fuck ups anywhere in any company, I think. So basically how we develop software at Focal Point is we have uh, user stories, we have a design, and then we have, um, you know, basically front end and back end tasks, right? The front end and back end task is developed, they get pushed into a QA environment, they get tested, they get tested, they get tested. Uh, and then we progress it into a staging, uh, to a test environment where we sort of do a demo, we make sure that we do scripts and so on and so forth. Then we push it into the staging environment to see how we do regression testing end to end. And then we push it into production, assuming all the tests are happening, right? This is what these, these types of certifications make you do. Um, and then you document it along the way so that no one can push code without it having been approved, without having gone through the proper rigor, make sure that you haven't inserted any vulnerabilities in the code. It's kind of like belt and suspenders, right? But it's, it's kind of important. I'm glad you know how your company manages code <laughs> because and I, I'm serious. I've talked to some people and they're like, I don't know how this stuff works. Like you are the CEO of your company. You don't need to be technical. You don't need to, you don't need to know how to write code, but if you don't understand how your company operates, sorry, but I think you should like go and spend some time doing that. Ultimately, for me, having been in procurement for so long, understanding how companies acquire software, like they will look for business continuity, they will look for disaster recovery, they will look for redundancy, they will look for virus scan, they will look for all these things. So I think as a company that's less than three years old, uh, you know, we have a lot of these things in place already that large companies are expecting. So for example, if AWS goes down, we have a backup cloud that we, we revert, we revert back to. Right. And it's just one of those things like it, it's, it's, it's a waste of money because we never had to use it, but sure. Like it's kind of like insurance. You hope you never have to use it, but holy smokes, if it's not there when you do, then you regret it. That's why you charge your customers the big bucks to, to make sure that it's there. 
Hopefully someday, yeah. <laughs> I guess what you're you're burning some of the seed money to to keep the, that backup cloud alive. You know, the seed money that that we that we raised has gone into developing these mature processes, developing a proper sales channel, developing a marketing channel. So we were heads down building product for the first two years, right? So we have a few large enterprise customers who are early adopters and and they helped us shape the product direction and helped us shape some of the features and functionalities that we have now rolled out. And then the seed money came in on the back of that. And really, and now we have matured the processes. We have gotten our SOC 2, we have um, a proper marketing function, we have proper sales function, and now we're starting to scale, right? So I have zero uh, reservations about going up to a multi-billion dollar company and say, we can take on your process. And we have the scalability and infrastructure to do that, um, you know, because again, I'm, I'm a bit of a propeller head in, in, in disguise, right? So. I go, I go in, I monitor logs. I go in, I look at the CPU count to make sure that we never go over 25% CPU utilization. Like I, I know this matters to people, right? Cause no one wants to click a button and wait three seconds for something to happen, right? It's kind of stupid, but you know, we've dealing with m literally millions of lines of data that we're, tra that we're tracking, but no one wants to wait three seconds. And I'm on like my CTO says a few times, like no one will, no one cares. I'm like, yes, they do. Right. And we don't want we don't want that, that one uh, new client to break the camel's back, so to speak. So we're all over that. And, you know, that's why seed money comes in real handy. I know we were thinking about server utilization and how we could tweak our own code to make things go as fast as possible. And it was always a struggle. You can't hardware uh, bad code out, right? <laughs> so you need to optimize your code um, at some point in time, uh, you know, and, and make sure that it, it runs the way it should. Um, but you know you can band-aid it with, with ha adding server power to some extent for a period of time and the investor's opinion is always throw more money at it and you'll fix the problem uh, surprisingly they they, they 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 do like that but at the same time they expect the revenue to come in the door as well right of course i've i've seen a big change in investor sentiment in the last 12 months where it used to be yeah have more money than you need and just throw money at it and now it's like can we not give you money and you just find a way to use the money you already have to like become profitable? Thanks. So we raised our seed round. We started in January of last year. And by March, we had term sheets uh, from our investors and we closed a $3 million round in May. And then the market went uh, pear shaped. And um, basically our lead investors came in and say, Hey, do you need some more money? Uh, we think your business is, 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 you know, really something we want to double down on. So if you need more capital, happy to give you some. And we basically, we negotiated new terms because I said, we don't really need the capital. But on the back of that, we ended up raising another two and a half million dollars. Uh, and the valuation went up significantly also. So, I mean, I, I think, well, I, I don't think, I know uh, our investors are, are very bullish. They've been really a pleasure to deal with. And I, I can't say enough good things about them. So I, I, I get asked all the time if I need more capital, which is kind of a blessing in this environment. I know a lot of investors have been uh, closing up their, their purse strings uh, recently, at least in, in the industries I'm familiar with. I've seen some investors are continuing to double down. I think ultimately, you know, they, they put bets on founders now, right? To make sure that founders that can, can deliver and execute rather than just a hairy idea that could potentially just be something. I think. Like you said, due diligence, right? It has to, you know, people do more due diligence now for lower check sizes. I've heard that B2B sales cycles can take up to 18 months. What do you find is a typical length of time for you? So we, our B2B sales cycles are fluctuating. It really depends on who you're selling to. Um, so we sold to a very large hotel chain that basically dominates the Las Vegas Strip. And our sales cycle there was 14 months. It wasn't because of this process. It's just the turnover in the, in the organization was tremendous. So uh, we had to sell to three different heads of procurement. So we sold to one, they said, yeah, let's go do this. And then that person quit. Uh, and then we had to sell the second person and they were like, yeah, let's do this. And then that person quit. <laughs> and the third person finally stayed and is still there today. That was 14 months. On the flip side of that, we, we made a sale in three months. They were like, this is fantastic. This is exactly what we need. Let's go do it, right? And a lot of that comes down to 
the size of the company, the industry they're in. Um, but as we're scaling now, we're budgeting for a, an average of six months, but you know, we can probably see that increasing significantly. We're trying to figure that out as we speak. With that also comes this idea that you have to communicate with them, right? So it's not like you can get a single call, obviously, and then they say, yes, that usually doesn't happen. So how do you build that relationship where they're constantly saying, well, yeah, let me think about it, or I need to talk to this person. Like, what does that actually look like? We qualify people in. So we say, hey, is there a need? Is there an urgency? Is there a timeline? Is there a budget, right? Typical band uh, qualification. And once we have qualified them in to say like, there's a real opportunity here, then we map out the stakeholders to say, all right, we're selling software to procurement, but procurement, while they might be the decision maker and the, and the holder of the purse strings, we also need information security. We need probably legal. We need probably um, IT. We need some integration with their existing infrastructure. This, this, it becomes a complex com complex acquisition, right? And we need to, to sing and dance with the other systems in the organization. So for us, it's all about making sure that we understand who the champion is, uh, what the road to close is, and how we can strategize about how to make that happen in the most expedient way. Uh, the other thing too is, is you know, people always think that, uh, not always, people often think that organizations can do this, like I said, with Excel spreadsheets and so on. And we, we meet that challenge often to say, well, you know, we have ServiceNow and ServiceNow is a workflow tool. Yeah, it is, but it's an IT ticketing system. It's never meant to ingest, you know, billions of dollars of procurement spend and, you know, a few hundred thousand suppliers and payment terms and all these kinds of things. Right. So it's just if all you if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we run up against that all the time, too, is sort of saying, like, it, it's not service now. It's not uh, Monday dot com or something like that. Um, so it's an interesting sales cycle. I have to tell you that I'm learning a lot as a seller rather than a buyer. Even on the consulting side, right, my, my company is providing consulting services. And so for us, it's like, okay, well, you know, tell us about what you're going through. What are your issues? What are your successes? Like, what are your customers like? So we, we get to know them and their business. And then, you know, f find if there is a need based on like, oh, actually, we could see this is a problem. It's a journey for us too sometimes because, you know, we sometimes run into organizations where they say, like, oh, what do you guys do? Like, what do you we, help procurement be more efficient. Well, we already spent a million dollars on Coupa or Ariba or whatever software. Great. You have the, you, ha you have the foundation and now let's get you from, you know, 60% to hundred um, percent. But it, it's interesting. Like most people might not realize what best in class looks like today because it's, it's moving so fast. So what does best in class look like right now? Predictability of the process. So people actually know how to get from point A point A to point B, what's involved, um, the stages they need to go through, who they need to engage and involve, um, and how long it's going to take, right? And I think the, having process transparency and then an easy way of actually doing it is what blessing class looks like. So that process is really up to your organization to define, depending on the circumstances they're in. But having this one size fits all, like, you know, you can have any color of the car as long as it's black. It's kind of how procurement software has been built, right? Like it's best in class because this is how we built it rather than saying like, what would you like your process to look like? And, and I think that's going to be the new, uh, new wave of procurement software, probably software in general, to be configurable to the needs of the organization rather than saying that we have developed one way of doing it. It's the right way because we built it. Uh, and, and, uh, take it from there. And uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting space. I love that you have that mindset of it's not about what I built, so you need to use it now. It's about I've built something that you can use and you can use and you can use and it'll work in different ways based on what you need. Because that's the mentality that I had with my startup, which was for internal team collaboration, which was you look at Slack, you look at teams, they built something that worked for them and everyone else has to use it that way but it wasn't flexible and it was horribly, uh, it wasn't scalable, it, it was horrible at scale. Um, and that's why we were trying to build a competitor to that. 
where it was designed through frameworks where you know this set of features are designed as kind of like a framework which is basically empty in that you can use it however you want but it'll be different for company a from company b from company c and that's just how it's designed and it's and it has to be that way because otherwise you have companies like my uh, former coo's uh, wife's company that she works for a really large company in malaysia and they had to spend a million dollars to adapt their operations to meet the needs of a software that they were paying for. Yeah, and, and you know, th this is one of my pet peeves. Like when I was a chief procurement officer for very large companies, I would have, uh, you know, I would have requirements to say, all right, my regulators are telling me I need to do this, 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 and this. How does your software do that? And they would say, well, that's not best practices. That's not best practices because that's not how we built our system. Uh, that doesn't negate my requirements, right? <laughs> So how, how will how will I meet this requirement? Well, my regulators are coming to me and looking for this evidence. If I don't do it, I'm going to be in trouble. And you know, I would I would throw them out of my office and they're like like you know, I'm sorry, you're behind the times. Like, why are you doing? Why are you selling to my industry? Like, because anyone worth their salt should be asking these questions. And if you don't meet the requirements, you're out. Um, so I think this is going to be a big change uh, for a lot of these large organizations. Yeah, I think it's going to be really important going forward. I think COVID's taught us a lot about how the way things were broken and people didn't realize they were broken or they didn't care that they were broken, but now they're like, oh, actually they're broken and we can see them very clearly and we need to not do that thing anymore. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the rest of the 2020s and beyond will be really exciting in that regard, pushing out the old and, and letting the new come in. And I think AI will have a big place in all of that. Do you guys have any AI in, in your processes or...? Uh, not as of yet. We are, you know, we're crowdsourcing a lot of data and, and what we're looking for are trends and patterns that uh, we can sort of say, all right, in, in IT services or, you know, you, pick, you picked on Slack, so I'm going to pick on Slack too, right? You can say, all right, so the average Slack contract is going from X dollars to Y dollars, like, so they're decreasing by X percent over time, like those kinds of things, like we want to be able to, to, to map out and so on and so forth. But we don't have the critical scale of the data yet, but we're definitely modeling it out. Um, we're a bit premature for that, um, but it, it's, it's kind of neat, right? Because once you get these large data sets, you can see like how much is the procurement organization pushing through in terms of, per, per uh, FTE, um, what is the risk they're taking on? Uh, what is the supplier performance on average? Like you get all this data and it's pretty cool, right? Uh, where you can start mining it and really provide intelligence back to companies. And I look forward to that as well. You might be able to ask chat GPT for that specific data point on Slack contracts. Possibly, <laughs> possibly, but then take that and, and you sort of like, what's the average price for chicken or beef or shrimp, you know, and, and sort of, start mining that out because well it's pretty cool right yeah you could i mean i used to manually keep in touch with all of the different manufacturers of um chicken feet and chicken thighs and chicken wings and and beef and pork and in uh brazil and there there was uh, in australia argentina and we we had to like um tell the different customers like well if you want the best that's like 100 percent hands down the brazilian beef but like the Argentinian chicken. So, you know, if you want to, you know, that's why it's $300 more per ton because like it's the best and everybody wants it. And if you want it, that's what you got to pay. If not, you know. What you're describing right now is what in, in procurement terms we call a category manager. So, you know, that category of proteins, let's call it right. And you, and you know, the inputs, the outputs, the prices, the lead times, the process to, to, to slaughter and, and manufacture and, and package and ship, right? So, um, but at scale, you know, we have a few hundred categories for each organization probably, right? And how do you, how do you maintain that knowledge base? So you can hire a bunch of people that can maintain that knowledge base, or you can, you know, get it through AI and machine learning. And that's probably at scale where it's at. I would much rather have a single AI that I don't have to pay a salary for that has infallible memory than humans that have to constantly communicate with each other. If only, you know, each manufacturer had an AI that would just communicate with all of the other AIs, which would then ingest the data into a central algorithm that then could spit out for your platforms to tell any of your clients that need that specific data, hey, these are the updated numbers as of five seconds ago. 
Right? No humans in the loop. Maybe one day, but you know, that's uh, Star Trek type stuff, right? So how can people follow up? Yeah. So if you're interested about procurement uh, or focal point in general, you can reach out to us at getfocalpoint.com or uh, look me up on uh, on LinkedIn, Anders Lillivick. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your energy, Anders. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you have a need to buy a ton of stuff and it's really complicated, check out getfocalpoint.com. And if you don't need it, hopefully you found this uh, educational and inspirational for you. I've, I definitely did learned a lot from it. And uh, yeah, thank you, Anders.